I just started playing around with um, with some tokens and I thought, hey, tokens are a classic thing people love to do on blockchains and there's a ton of different ways to do them on Substrate. And I, I was sort of brainstorming and I was like, oh, I can think of at least three different ways to do like, you know, a token or a cryptocurrency on Substrate. And then as I started to get prepared, I ended up thinking of six total. So I'm definitely not prepared to like demo all six of them, but we can at least talk through all six of them. And um, you know, uh, demo a, a few of them. So maybe I'll just start the conversation by saying like, does any, can anybody think of some ways to, to launch a token? I can imagine two ways of creating tokens on Substrate. First, I believe more obvious is a using of assets module, assets palette. Mm -hmm. And the second one is to create a completely custom token in your own palette. The same way like uh, ERC20 on Ethereum network. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So one, yeah, different, different palette options, right? One is the balances palette. That's like probably the easiest way because it already comes with the node template and everything. And then, yeah, right. Your own palette's a good one. Yep. That's a good idea. Anybody else want to throw out some ideas? You could use the contracts palette and then write a smart contract that implements an ERC 20 token. Yeah, totally. Like when Ricardo was on the other day, I, we didn't do it, but we talked about at least there's like an ink equivalent of the ERC-20 contract. So you could use that with the contracts palette. And then Dan, I know we were talking about one just half an hour ago. Do you want to share that? It's kind of similar. Yeah. So that would be uh, using the EVM palette and then implementing an ERC-20 token um, with EVM bytecode essentially. Yeah, totally. So we could do a smart contract with the EVM palette, smart contract with the contracts palette. We could use the balances palette. Um, Gleb said we can write a custom palette that does a token. And there's actually um, two others in the, like what used to be called the SRML, like all these palettes that come with substrate that do tokens. And so we can look at those too. And then the last one I thought of right before this started that I, I had totally forgotten about was that we could write a palette that does uh, UTXOs. Um, and I, Dan, were you the one that was work? Someone told me they were brushing the dust off the UTXO workshop. That yeah. was me, yep. And I, I put together a, a project based on the node template and I'll, maybe I'll start by showing you guys where it is. And it, what it includes is uh, three palette based solutions. And then, you know, depending on how far we get and how much time and interest there is, maybe we can try to hack some more of them in there. You know, as always, if we get derailed or on a tangent or whatever, that's totally welcome. So let me start by just showing you where this code is so that you can follow along. And right now it lives, uh, oh, here, I have it right here. So this is our regular, like our Substrate Developer Hub organization and our Substrate Node Template repo. And so we've worked from this repo a lot on the seminar. And I'm on this particular branch right here. It's called Generic Asset Fees. And this is not going to be like a pull request. I'm not planning to merge this back into the main node template, but it's just a, you know, the node template's a place that it's nice to start hacking. So let me send everybody that link. So, uh, okay. So here's the runtime folder, source, librs. And being the node template, we have this template module in here. I left it in. I didn't do anything with it. Um, so we, we're not going to really be looking at this at all today, but um, I just, it's just still there. So like the interesting stuff today is mostly in this runtime librs file. Um, and let's see. So I have three token related palettes installed on this runtime. And I guess this is the best place to look at them. So the first one is balances. That's the one that comes with, you know, pretty much every substrate chain, unless you take it out. It's the one that does the KSM token on Kusama and it's the one that's going to be the Polkadot token or the dot token on Polkadot. The other one is this one called generic asset. And this is a really fully featured palette that allows you to have multiple tokens in your runtime. Um, and you know, we'll get into all of this, but it implements the currency trait so we can use it pretty much anywhere that balances is, is expected. Um, and then the last one is this one assets. And I only learned about assets when I was preparing for this call. I thought that it was just balances and generic asset, but there's also assets and assets is 
sort of similar to generic asset. It allows you to have multiple tokens, uh, but they're pretty simple tokens. They don't have the features about like locking or um, things like that. They don't have like this imbalance thing where you can like mint tokens into someone's account and then it gives you back this imbalance um, object. So assets is like a, a simpler one. And so I have those all installed here. Um, so I also have the chain running. Let's see, uh, I'm trying to decide what I wanna, wanna talk about next. I guess I'll just, just to tell you that I did this, like one, one cool thing that I did is normally in this node template, there's these transaction fees and you're paying transaction fees with the balances palette. So you have, you know, some token, um, balances is always a single token. And so everybody has their balance. And when you submit a transaction, this transaction payment palette handles charging the fees and it charges them from balances. But it turns out that transaction payment doesn't have to only use balances. It can use anything that implements the currency trait. So let me just show you where I made that happen. So here's where we implement the transaction palettes configuration trait. And um, there's a couple items in here, you know, some of them I didn't even use when you put it to unit, that pretty much means like, I'm not too worried about that. There is the transaction base fee, which I set to 10 tokens. So that just means every transaction takes 10 tokens, no questions. Um, and then there's also the transaction byte fee, which I set to 10. And so that means for every byte of the encoded transaction, it's going to be 10 more tokens. So like if I had a, a transaction that was three bytes long, that would be 30 tokens for the byte fee plus another 10 for the base fee. And then there's this other thing called, called weight. And, you know, maybe we can get into the details of fees if people are interested in that. Um, but the, the punchline that I'm building up to right now is that this used to say, this top line, this first associated type, it used to say this. Oh, whoops. It used to be balances here. And so those fees would be charged in the balances palette. But now I've um, set it up so that I'm using spending asset currency of self. And um, spending asset currency is something we can dive into, but it comes from that generic asset palette. Uh, in fact, we can see that. Because I imported it from the generic asset palette. So that's the critical line where I said, hey, transaction payment palette, do all the same fee stuff you always do, but instead of charging fees from balances, charge them from generic asset. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, kill my chain and start a fresh one and we can play around with this thing a little bit. And then as questions come up, we can dig into the code. Can I ask a question, Josh, you just based on what you said so far? Totally, yeah, please do. So you mentioned that balances was a single token and generic assets was multiple tokens or, or assets or whatever. Yep. So how does the transaction know which one of those assets to charge? Yeah, great question. So th that question is why uh, it was a little more roundabout than it, you might have seen. Like when I had to use this spending asset currency, um, the reason that it wasn't so straightforward, let me go back down for a second. Um, so in the previous one, it just said balances, right? Like that's pretty straightforward. We're using the balances palette. So like my first guess about how to do this was that it would just be like a uh, generic asset. Like that's totally analogous, right? And this didn't work. And the reason is exactly what you're saying, because there in general are going to be many assets here. And so we have to tell it each one. Um, so let's, let's just take a peek at the, uh, the code for this generic asset palette and I'll show you how that works. So, uh, oh yeah. So let me, uh, just so everybody can kind of follow along. Like I have two, uh, two windows open with my code editor and this one we've looked at so far and that we're still looking at, this is the node template. That's the link I sent you guys. And then this other one is the main substrate code. And I haven't done any hacking here at all. I haven't changed anything, but it's, you know, pretty nice to have it available so that we can like look at the code of these palettes we're using. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm in this generic asset palette and, oh, and I'm in, I'm in exactly the right spot. So, Decal storage is where we set up, you know, the storage for the palette. 
And um, we'll just look at some of these, I guess. They're a little, I don't know, we haven't encountered a bunch of them with these build blocks and that makes it a little bit harder to read these things. Um, but build basically just tells us how to do the um, Genesis configuration. So my advice is like, let's not dig into this too deep right now. We can dig into it deeper if we want to later. But the important part that I was going to show is that we have a storage item called total issuance. And it is a map um, from asset ID to balance. So asset ID is just a U32 in our case. And basically what we're saying is like, for each one of these assets, we'll give it a number. So like asset zero has some total issuance. Asset one has some total issuance. And so this map keeps track of like for each asset, for each index of asset, what's its total issuance. And then we can see the same with all these other ones like free balance. So this one's a double map and it's a double map from an asset ID just like before. So we can say like for asset zero and some particular account, like maybe Bob's account, how much free balance does Bob have? or like for asset three and my account, how much free balance do I have? Um, reserved balance works exactly the same way. And so the idea is basically like, instead of just having a single total issuance, a single free balance, a single reserved balance, we have those things for each asset that we have. Um, so Dan, back to your question, what we really have to do is just specify like, okay, of all of these potential assets, like there could be a whole bunch of them, um, which one are we going to charge the fees in? So that takes us to this idea of the currency trait. And maybe I'll just show the docs for it real quick. So substrate.dev slash Rust docs will show us all these like docs that get written with along with the substrate code. And the, the one that I'm looking for right now is currency. And it, Eventually, when you do these enough, you start to learn where they're from, but I always still search for them just to be totally sure. So this is the one we're looking for, frame support traits currency. Um, and it tells us abstraction over fungible assets system. And um, currency was written in order to have this abstract idea of a currency, and then the balances palette was written to implement this trait. And then later it came along that other people implemented the trade in other ways. And that's kind of what we're looking at today. Like generic assets came later and also implemented this, uh, this trade. So it has, it has all these methods. Like if you want to have a token that acts like a currency, like one that we can charge fees in, for example, or that you can use with the staking palette to, to stake tokens, then it has to have all these methods. And most of them are straightforward. Like what's the total balance um, of this person and uh, what's another straightforward one? What's the total issuance of the token? What's the minimum balance of the token? Um, so minimum balance basically means in some cases you don't want people to have accounts that just have pennies in them because then you have to use all the storage to keep track of values that are like, you know, just chump change and not worth remembering. So they give you this way to say like, okay, if, you know, if your balance falls below some particular amount, then your account gets swept up. Um, yeah, okay. So in, in the balances palette, we implement this currency trait once just for the palette, because again, it's only a single currency. So in the generic asset um, palette, we have to implement this in a, in a way that it can work for any token. So let me just find it. Um, and it's going to be like the block is basically going to be like impl currency. And you can see it says it doesn't find it. And the reason is because we have to take some generic type parameters. There it is. And I didn't like somehow magically know what to type there. I only knew it said that because I've been looking at this code for the last day and a half to, to get ready for seminar. So here's what it does. It makes a struct called asset currency and it takes these two generic parameters and we'll see what they are in a second. And uh, then it implements the currency trait, that same one we were just looking for, for this asset currency struct. Okay, cool. And then it tells us what the type parameters are. T is our modules configuration trait, the same thing um, you know, that, that we've used a bunch of times. And then U is this thing called asset ID provider. And it's basically just any struct that will give us back an integer that tells us the asset ID. So like if we wanna pay our fees in asset number three, 
this particular thing, this asset ID provider has a function um, called, uh, well, it's in here somewhere. I'll find it in a second. I forget what it's called, but it gives us back the number three. And then that's how we know what we're going to, um, what we're going to use for, for taking fees. Oh yeah. Oh, it's right here. Yeah. They're doing it in all of these. So actually let's look more carefully because this is pretty interesting. So if you remember that that currency trait had a function called total balance and it's just supposed to tell us like whoever we pass here, what their total balance is. So I could say like total balance of Bob and it'll tell me 15 tokens, total balance of Joshi, six tokens, total balance of Phil, whatever, a hundred tokens. Um, and so what this one does is it calls into two other sort of helpers here, free balance and reserve balance. And so, let's see how free balance is implemented. And this, this is where we see that the trick that this, um, like the, the way that they've implemented currency for asset currency works. So when we call free balance, you know, we take who, who are we asking for? And in the balances palette itself, where there's only a single token, this is pretty straightforward. It just looks up that storage item, like free balance of whoever and gives back the value. But here we have this, this map, like when we look, we saw that map in Deckel storage earlier. So when we look up the free balance, we have to give it not only who we're asking for, we do give it that, but we also have to give it an asset ID. And so this is where we finally use you, that parameter that had the type asset ID provider. And it, so it tells us what asset ID we're looking for, and that's how we read storage. And then this same palette, or this same pattern happens like everywhere. When you call currencies total issuance, which doesn't take any parameters, we look up storage and we just, you know, same thing. We give it that asset ID. Um, oh yeah, we, so we talked about minimum balance and in the balances palette that there's this whole concept of existential deposit that works like how I said, you know, if your balance gets too low, then you lose those tokens. Um, the generic assets palette has chosen not to do that. So minimum balance is just always zero for every asset. Uh, okay, and then I guess just to tie the, the, the knot, you know, like not that I expect this to be 100% clear yet, but I'll, I'll show you all the pieces and then we can dive deeper as we see fit. On the very last line of this whole palette, this is where we define that type spending asset currency. And so you can see that the type spending asset currency is just an asset currency. That's the thing we were just looking for that implements the, the currency trait. And um, what it does is it gives us, it, you know, it takes two parameters, T and U. T is the trait, so we just pass that in. And then U is this thing that can give us an asset ID. And so they have this other thing, spending asset ID provider of T, and we'll just look at, for that. So there it is, um, spending asset ID provider. So there's two of them. They have like staking asset ID provider and spending asset ID provider. And then they implement this asset ID provider trait. And here's the function I told you about. All it does is return a number. And that number comes from a, uh, a piece of storage here. So if we wanted to have like, you know, six different currencies that were used for, for different things, um, you know, maybe we wanted to have one that was specific to gambling, then we could just do the same thing here, like uh, pubstruct gambling asset ID provider uh, T, and then like it needs that same thing. And then we'll just implement that trait. Let me copy the code there uh, for what do I call it gambling uh, asset ID provider T okay great and then you know just like when you implement any trait you have to give it all the associated types and all the functions well asset ID is easy so we're just going to take the same asset ID that we've used everywhere which in this particular node that I wrote for the demo, the asset ID is U32. So what it means is like we can only have two to the 32 possible assets, which is, you know, probably plenty for any use case. But if for some reason you want more, we could change it to U64 or U128 or, or whatever. Um, and then we have to give it this function 
asset ID. And, you know, they, for these two that are here, they did this cool thing that maybe we'll talk about in a little bit where they actually store the particular asset ID in runtime storage, but there's no reason you have to do it that way. Um, we could just return like, okay, let's say we want uh, lucky number 13 to be the gambling asset ID. We can just return 13 there. And since it's a, since it has this type, we might have to do something like that. Um, and so what we've done now is like, okay, when we go back to our runtime, if we want to make this thing interface with some gambling palette that needs a notion of currency, great. We just get, oh, uh, I forgot the one last piece and that's this one. So we would just have to do this. And so now, you know, we would import this type gambling asset currency and we can give that to whatever palette we were going to gamble with, for example. So good question, Dan. That was a, <laughs> that was a long detailed answer. <laughs> Hope that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, my headphones just died, but yes, that was very helpful. Okay, cool. Um, okay. Just because I kind of lost you at the end there when my headphones messed up. Um, okay. So if we go back to the module, like the, the original thing that we were looking at, does that implement some function that returns the asset ID that we want? Uh, yeah, okay, so, so that's a good question. So um, in this, it, it doesn't do it exactly that way, but it's super close to that. So let me, let me show you how that works. Um, okay, so here's the one I just provided that I just wrote. And this one's like a little more straightforward because I just hard coded like the gambling asset ID right here. Um, the spending asset ID, this is the one we actually use. And instead of hard coding it, you can see what it does here. It goes module T spending asset ID. Well, what this is, I'll put a comment on here. Get the asset ID from palette storage. So there's a storage item called spending asset ID. And I'll show it to you right now. So here's all our storage items. And we looked at the first few. These are like the more important ones that actually implement the currency. What we didn't look at was these last two. These are just very simple storage items. They're not even maps or anything. They're just individual storage items that have type asset ID, asset ID. So the ID is actually stored in runtime storage. So then the, the final question is like, well, how the heck did we ever get a value into runtime storage? Where did that come from? And so I'm just going to switch windows. So remember, uh, I'm switching from substrate back to our actual node template. And in our Genesis configuration, uh, here it is. Here's where I configured the generic asset palette. That's the one that we're looking at. Um, and what you can see what I did here is I set the spending asset ID to 16,001. So if we wanted to use a different asset ID, like, you know, maybe we just wanted to use zero, for example, I could put zero there. And then the idea is, is that you could theoretically at a later date go in and update this value if you wanted to. Yeah, bingo. That's, that's why they've taken all this extra complexity of like storing it in a run in runtime storage, you know, that's one of those things that like makes the code less clear. I think it was the code was more readable when I just hard coded it, the 13 in there. But yeah, this gives us the flexibility of later saying like, you know, maybe through a governance proposal, like, hey, we're sick of paying our fees in this particular asset or like, you know, it's become really valuable. So let's not pay fees in it anymore. And then you can just make a proposal to change which asset you're using. Yeah. And I know for someone like me, who's pretty new to Rust, like, the many, many layers of uh, indirection that Rust uses can be super confusing. Yeah. So that kind of breakdown that you just gave of how it all kind of plays out and the syntax that I've just kind of been assuming is magic up until now, like that was super helpful and kind of helps solidify things. So thanks for that explanation. Yeah, you're welcome. And I, I kind of identify the same way you do. Like I'm, you know, I'm becoming a better Rust programmer every day, but I'm, I wouldn't consider myself a good Rust programmer. And so like, it was possible for me to figure this out because someone else had written it and I could just look through it and see like what wires up to what. But yeah, I agree. It's kind of hard to like always know exactly what to code just from looking at the APIs. 
Okay, so I think at this point maybe we'll just start to to play with the the node a little bit, and then I we'll we'll get back to code. I'm almost sure later on. So I do have the node running, but I've I've done a couple of things with it already. So I'm actually just going to kill it, and then you know it's always a good idea to purge your chain. So I'll clear out my chain, and I'll start a new one. Okay, cool. Oh yeah, okay, and so before we start playing with this, I wanna look at the Genesis configuration a little bit more. So here's our own node and here's the Genesis configuration again. And so basically like what all of this does in the Genesis config from here on 121 down to wherever it ends, which I think is here, this sets up the initial state of the blockchain. Like what is the state gonna be at the Genesis block? And so it's pretty common that you'll see something where the balances palette is configured like uh, with no vesting, but then the, the balances, a lot of times you'll give these like in doubt accounts. So you might see something like this um, in doubt accounts dot clone or something like that. And so in a development chain, the in doubt accounts are Alice and Bob and Alice stash and Bob stash. But what I did here was I just changed this to an empty vector and what that means. We lost your audio, Joshi. Oh, you guys lost audio? Oh no. So anyway, I was saying like, uh, no, nobody starts with any of these tokens that come from the balances palette. Now that doesn't mean they can't get any, like if we make a pseudo call to give them some, but there won't be any to begin with. Um, and then the generic assets palette, that's the one that we were, or it's generic assets, sorry, man, how many times did the compiler complain about me doing this? Um, so generic asset, the Genesis config works like this. You tell it, First of all, which assets do you want to already provide funds for? So we're gonna, we're gonna um, give the endowed accounts funds in these two particular assets, 16,000 and 16,001. Um, and the reason we chose those are because we, those are the ones that we use for like staking asset ID and spending asset ID. This, you know, I should say like, we're not really using this. It's this staking asset ID is, just another asset, just like all of them. But spending asset ID, this one we are using. Um, we're paying fees in this one. And then, uh, so, okay, so it says like, when you're giving people initial balances, how many should you give? And so we gave them uh, 1 billion tokens. And then who's gonna get the, uh, the like initial tokens? And that's basically what I did above, you know, just the endowed accounts. And then there was a little, we had to do a little bit of, converting. I'm not really sure why that had to happen, but this is one of those like things that I'm not super good at with Rust, but the, the type checker needed a different type for some reason. Um, so the, the punchline here is that like these endowed accounts are Alice, Alice stash, Bob, Bob stash, and all four of those accounts are going to have a billion tokens in both of these two assets. So like if we wanted to, you know, I didn't recompile that code or whatever, but if we wanted to seed them with some gambling funds, we could give them that asset ID too. And now they all get a billion funds to gamble with in asset number 13. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't talked about this one yet, but I will just because it's sitting here and we've talked about all the other ones. And the, the reason that you would have that we have this next asset ID is because we don't have to make all of our assets at Genesis. We can create new tokens with this palette later on or at any time really. And so when we create one, then the, it will get the asset ID 17,000 and then 17,001 would be next and 17,002 would be next. Um, okay, so I, this was not in the actual code that we wrote. Okay, good. Looks like the UI is working. We've got all our 43 blocks here and everything. Um, and so I guess maybe we'll just start here. Like I'll go to this accounts tab and we've seen the accounts tab a whole bunch of times. It's where you track your cryptocurrencies, but accounts is actually per specifically wired to the balances palette. So you can see it says, you know, Alice has no tokens. Bob has no tokens. So question for the field, like why did these guys not have tokens? Didn't we give them a billion tokens each? The different token. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is showing the balances palette, not the generic asset one. And so they don't have any balances. So something I noticed just a, like an hour ago or maybe an hour before the call started was that there is a generic asset tab here, like Polkadot apps comes with this. But then what I noticed is it seems to not be working. So I 
either I'm doing something wrong or it's just a little bit broken. Because oh wow, it seems to be working this time. That's great. I I couldn't get that to go before. So let's just see if we can tell it about a new ID. 16,000, and this was like the uh, staking asset that we're not using. Oh yeah, see this is what always happened before, like uh, it, it wouldn't show anything new there, but it, it shows these ones now for some reason. What if I just refresh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not too sure. There, there might be some bugs here or something, but um, we can still do everything we need to do through extrinsics and chain state, anyway. So, just to start with some chain state, like if I go to the regular old balances palette and I check the free balance of Alice, we get zero, just like we expected and just like we saw in the accounts tab. And if I go to generic asset, that's the one we looked at and I want to check someone's free balance. Now it has to ask me for two things. It says, first of all, which ID, and then, you know, whose balance are you checking? So let's start with asset zero. Well, there's no balance there. That's because we haven't used asset zero, but let's try our, um, let's try the one that we're going to pay fees with. Okay, great. There's the billion tokens like we expected. And I think we said Alice Stash should have those two and Bob and Bob Stash should also. And then they also have, are pre-funded with asset uh, 16,000, which is the one that we're not using, but we pre-funded anyway. Um, okay, so that all looks normal. So the next thing I wanted to check was, you know, I, I claimed that we were going to be able to pay our transaction fees with this uh, asset 16,001 with our spending asset. So let's just go ahead and try. We'll have Alice submit some kind of transaction and what should it be? Uh, so, okay, yeah, so this will this will work. So I'm gonna have Alice trans, not burn, but uh, transfer some of her asset ID 16,000 to Bob. Or let's send it to someone who doesn't have any yet. How about Charlie? And then the question is like, okay, well, how much is she gonna send Charlie? That seems like an easy number. And so what I'm expecting after this happens is, you know, one thing that definitely should happen is Charlie should get these 12,000 more funds and Alice should lose those 12,000 more funds. But I'm also expecting Alice to lose a little bit of funds with asset ID 16,001 because she's going to have to pay some transaction fees for this. So now the have moment. a way to estimate the amount of fees. Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, we we can yeah so yeah because you're saying can like you repeat the, the question yeah the question was can we estimate the amount of fees like how you know if we're expecting fees to be taken how many should it be so it should be a base fee that's easy that's 10 plus a byte fee times the length of the transaction i'm not sure how to do the length of the transaction and then a wait fee um, and the wait fee we can look up in the in the palette so let's let's just do as much as we can here that's going to be 10 plus 10 times some question marks oh uh, these are the question marks and then the wait fee is currently question marks so <laughs> um, so so let's try to fill in some of those numbers Okay, and the standard asset palette does not provide us a method for calculating those fees. Oh, yeah, okay. So there is a way, there's this RPC call that you can make in order to estimate your transaction fees. The, the trouble, and what I noticed the other day, is that the node template doesn't have that RPC installed. Um, <laughs> so let's go on a That's little fun. detour here. Yeah, and even if RPC installed, not every user or, or not every node could have those RPC calls, and probably it should be somehow provided in form of maybe extrinsic or some storage data. Oh, yeah, so that's an interesting thought. So you're definitely right that like 
just because this RPC code is written doesn't mean every node will provide it. That's true. Exactly. If we make it an on-chain call though, like an extrinsic, then you have to also pay the fees for making that on-chain call. So you have to pay fees to estimate your fees, which is not super ideal. Um, yeah. But currently, without RPC call, the only way to get the amount of fees is actually make a transaction. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. It, this is a kind of a fun tangent to be on too, though. I just want to see how, how good we can do here if we can calculate this. Uh, the weight we can look up because that would come from whatever palette we're about to call. So we said, okay, so we said we're going to transfer some funds from Alice to Charlie. And the, the method we're calling is generic asset transfer. So let's just look back at that palette again for a second. Uh, so here's generic asset. And then here's transfer. Ah, okay. So there's no weight annotated on here. Normally, you the way you would annotate weight is you would do something like this, weight equals. Um, and I bet I can show you one. I bet balances has one. <laughs> guess that word transfer comes up a lot. <laughs> Almost. There it is. Okay, yeah, right. So in the balances palette, a transfer costs this many tokens, 1 million tokens. Uh, I don't know what the, what the default is, though, when, when they're not annotated like this. So let's just reverse engineer it. We'll, we'll just go ahead and make the call and see how many how much fees got deducted. So, okay, great. So I'll sign it with Alice's key. And it looks like that went through, so that's good. So now we just have to test all our hypotheses. And so... Joshi? Yeah. What did the... So I, I noticed that the, on the very bottom right drop down it said dev, which I've always taken to mean like the cryptocurrency identifier. Um, yes. But since we were using a different one. Yeah. Let me just set that up again. This is what you're talking about, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're right. Dev is the name of the token that's given by default. Like if you're not a known chain. So like if we were connected to Polkadot, that would say dot, or if we were connected to Kasamba, it would say KSM. But for any chain that doesn't specify, it just defaults to saying dev right there. And you're right. I that. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like when you, when you just bring up the node template without having hacked on it, like I did, dev is the currency associated with the balances palette. But the, the UI isn't smart enough to notice that like we're actually paying fees with a totally different palette and so it could maybe do something different here. This is just going to show dev. Yeah. Um, that, that's a nice observation. I actually hadn't even noticed that before. So, okay, so let's see here. Generic assets. So one hypothesis was that Charlie should have some free balance now in this token that we sent him. So that looks good. And remember, there's all these decimal places too. And then the next hypothesis was that Alice should have spent one, two, three, four, five of these tokens. And it looks like she did, so that's good. And the final hypothesis was that Alice should have paid some fees in this other asset, the, the spending asset that we're paying fees with. And it looks like she did, just, uh, just a few, not very many. Yeah. Okay, that's great. I'm feeling pretty good about that. Uh, okay, so I said there were going to be three palettes here that we were going to use. And we, I guess technically I haven't used the balances one yet. I'll delay that because I feel like people have seen it a bunch. We've talked a lot about generic assets, so that's really cool. What we haven't done anything with yet was this other one called just plain asset. Or assets, that one's plural. So let's just, I usually like to explore just by seeing what's available. So the, the calls that we could make are destroy, issue, and transfer. Um, and if you remember, this palette doesn't take any Genesis config. So that means we can't start the chain with some of these existing. So the first thing we'll do is just go ahead and issue one of these tokens. 
And by the way, you know, this palette basically does a lot of the stuff that ERC-20 standard does, even though it's not a smart contract, it's just a palette, but that's like the, the behavior it's simulating. So we'll just go ahead and create an asset uh, here. It's gonna assign an ID, and I think the first ID will be zero, but we'll just have to see. And then we have to tell it like, okay, when I create this token, how many tokens are gonna exist? So maybe we'll just do like uh, 7,000. Seems like a good number. Uh, okay, so that seems good. Seems like it went. Um, and we'll just make sure. Assets, we'll check. Uh, okay, yeah, we'll check the, I guess we'll check the balance of asset ID zero and Alice and, okay, cool. There's our 7,000 tokens. And again, there's like, somehow it decides a certain number of decimal places to put on here. I'm not totally sure where that happened. Um, so we should expect like when we check a different asset ID, then we, we don't have any balance. That makes total sense. And when we go back to the asset that does exist, when we check someone else's account, Bob also doesn't have any. And so this, in, remember assets is the simple one. And so in this simple one, like when Alice says, hey, I wanna create a token, Alice just gets all the initial tokens. And then if she wants, she can make some transfers. So like let, we can see that too. Uh, transfer, uh, so we'll take some of ID zero, we'll send it over to Bob and we'll send, I guess like 1000 tokens to Bob. Okay, that seems good. We'll just double check here. Oops. So uh, now Bob has a thousand, and when we check Alice again, she should be down to six thousand. Okay, so another question for everybody: Alice just made a new token with seven thousand units. Then she sent a thousand of them to Bob, and we see that Bob got them correctly. So Alice's balance now is down to exactly 6,000. And if you use cryptocurrency before, that might seem a little weird because it seems like usually her balance would have been like five, nine, 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 and then some dust because she had to pay some fees. So my question for you guys is, why didn't this go down a little bit more? Like why weren't fees deducted from this? Because they were paying with the currency from generic assets. Yeah, bingo, that's right. We we wired up the fees not to come from assets, but to come from generic asset. So if we check Alice's spending currency over here, now this has gone down even a little bit more. Like I think this digit used to be an eight and now it's down to a six. Yeah, so, so very good. Um, it looked like the last extrinsic that we could have done from assets was destroy. And I think what that's gonna do is just uh, take totally destroy asset zero. And I'm, I'm just thinking like, I haven't looked at the code yet, but I hope that only Alice can destroy the token that she created and, and not Bob. So I just want to check that real quick. Oh, wow. It's not going to even let me submit that. Hmm. Yeah, it's still not going to let me do that. Oh. Maybe that was the glitch. Maybe I just had to type that zero. Huh, okay, cool. We'll just make sure that that's gone now. Uh, oh yeah, right. And okay, so her balance is gone. So that's, that's good. That's cool. Um, one, I guess one other little thing that I'll show here, just a, like a tidbit that I can picked up check, on. Can we check Charlie's balance to see if he still has the thousand? Just oh, yeah. Oh, great idea. Yeah, I forgot we sent Charlie some. That's a great idea. Ooh. He doesn't. That was, okay, wow. So that was supposed to be asset zero, right? Huh. Okay, yeah, and we only created that one. I almost want to do that experiment again because that seems a little bit funky. Assets, 
so, okay, so we're going to issue a total. I'll just do it the same as before so that we don't forget like which numbers were which. So Alice is going to create an asset. It's presumably going to be asset ID number one, and she's going to have 7,000 tokens. Okay, that seems right, and we'll just double check. Charlie should have, oh, whoops, sorry, we're on asset ID one now. So Charlie should have none of those, and Alice should have 7,000 of them. Okay, that all seems good. So then we'll do the transfer, just like we did before. Assets, transfer, ID one. We're going to send them to Charlie, and we'll give Charlie a 1,000 of them. Whoops. There we go. Okay, that seems like it worked, and we'll just double check. So we're on ID one, and Charlie just got a thousand tokens, and Alice has her six thousand. Okay, so that all looks good and normal. Um, and then, if I remember right, what we did last time was we just had Alice destroy ID number one. And uh, let's just see what happens here. Okay, asset one. So Alice should have zero, and that is fine again, like it was before. But we sort of thought Charlie should still have his his thousand tokens. Oh, and he does that time. Wow, weird. Did you transfer to Bob, maybe? Can you check asset zero for Bob? Just, I don't know. Can yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I'm glad we confirmed that that all worked as expected. <laughs> well, yeah, and the other thing that I was interested to see is that, like, because I think it said you can, like, it seems like it's somehow still managing both assets though, right? Like it's still managing the asset with ID zero and ID one. Yeah. So it's not like it can only manage one at a time. Totally. Yeah. So with this palette, you can have, um, this is similar to generic asset in the sense that you can have up to two to the 32nd assets at a time or two to whatever power you set as your asset ID type. Yeah. Oh, okay. They're just less flexible assets. Yeah, exactly. Like they don't implement the currency trait. Um, they don't have like locks or reserves or things like that. But you still can have okay. many of them at a time. Yeah. Multiple of them. Okay, gotcha. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're welcome. No problem. In fact, I don't think we looked at the storage items on this one yet. Um, where are they? Depot storage. So there's only there's only three storage items on assets, and maybe we should have started here actually because this one's simpler than generic asset. Um, so next asset ID is a, just a regular storage item, and it's you know of type asset ID, which again is you know U32 for us, um, and it's it started at zero. It's going to go up, up, up the the whole way, and then. Balances is a map, just like we saw before. In fact, this one's a lot nicer because it doesn't have all that config stuff that made it hard to read. So this one's just a map um, of asset ID, so which token we're talking about, and who owns it to their balance. And then total supply is just a map of like for each asset ID, how much how much balance is there. So let's see here. Um, I want to just double check, like I'm pretty sure this is going to work the way we expect, but what we just learned was that Bob actually had some of ID, some of asset zero. And so let's see if we can get him to destroy his amount also. Uh, wait. Oh, yeah, that's the one. Nice. You know what I just realized we haven't checked out yet is this total supply thing. So I think Alice and Bob have both destroyed all of their assets zero. So there should be none of that left. 
But if I remember right, Charlie still has some of his S at one. So, okay, cool, yeah. And then let's just try one that we haven't even created yet. Like none, none of any of those assets, that all makes sense. Okie doke. Uh, in this question, uh, in this case, fees are just evaporated and not going anywhere. Oh yeah, like what are we doing with the fees that we're collecting? Uh, yeah, could we collect oh. them? Because as far as I see, uh, we have not seen any balance of uh, token of asset zero or any fees collected somewhere. We have zero as total balance. Yeah, so right. Fees well, go nowhere. nowhere. Remember, first of all, remember that our fees are coming from generic assets. Oh yeah, and they're they're coming yeah, from that my mistake. Yeah, but I think I think you're right though that like although we're collecting them, you know, this number keeps going down, so they're being collected. Like, where do they go? I think the answer is nowhere. But to be honest with you, I never thought about that. But I I at least know where that we could maybe start looking for a clue, and that is in our run so i'm back in our this is our node that we've been playing with all along today and i'm in uh the runtime live our at oh in fact it's even the right line so like here's where we implemented transaction payment and i think this is where we said like don't do anything with them just throw them away um but i'm i'm curious like if we look at the full node in the substrate repo we'll probably see something more interesting than unit here and that'll probably confirm whether whether I was right. So let's just do a little detour. So I, my left column here is tiny text. Sorry, I, I wish I knew a way to make it bigger, but I can never figure it out. But uh, okay, so now we're in the node and the nodes runtime source live RS. So this is the analogous file to the one that I've, I've been looking at in our node, but with the full substrate node, this is a lot more complex. It looks a lot more like a, like Polkadot, for example. So let's look for transaction payment. Oh, that was a, let me go back to that one actually. Uh, this was not what I was looking for, but it was something that we talked about earlier. So you can see that we one of the things we're using here is this pallet transaction payment, and we're looking at the RPC and the, specifically the runtime API for that RPC. So with this node, this full substrate node, we actually do have that transaction fee estimating RPC installed. Um, okay. Anyway, this is what I was looking for, and ah, uh, yeah, okay. Fees method. Yeah. What was that? Uh, the fees fees method. Yeah, deal with fees. I have no idea what that is, but let's just see if we can find it. Pub type deal with fees equals split two ways. And uh, okay, <laughs> this. So it's not a method. Yeah. What'd you say, Gleb? It's not a method uh, saying what exactly we should do with fees, but or uh, but more a structure. Already yeah. passing data to some method which which already knows what to do with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is a this is something you'll see kind of a lot. And it's, you know, kind of like Dan was saying about like, in, in direction for, uh, you know, like in, in Rust code and everything. So like, whenever you're implementing one of these traits, so like, I'm looking at system now, that's kind of not that good of an example. But like, uh, okay, babe, that's a good one. You know, there's all these associated types you can put in here. And they really do have to be types. It can't be like, a struct it can't be a function it, it has to be a type and so the way we get around it you know or get around is sort of the wrong word but it's sort of the right word the way we get around it is that we make these types but the types just have static methods that give us the values that or are perform the functions we want so like um for example you know we pass in this type here epoch duration but all that type is, is one of these parameter types things. It just has a, a static method that returns a U64 value, whatever this constant is. Um, so let's look, so I'm gonna jump from, instead of the code this time, I, I like to go to uh, this docs thing. So let's just see, split two ways. There it is, frame support traits, split two ways. Um, split an unbalanced amount two ways between a common divisor. So unbalanced, what that means is um, this is common to, to many tokens. So assets, the simple one, does not deal with imba Im imbalances. 
but balances palate and the more complex generic acids both do this. And anytime you have a method that either creates tokens, like mints some new tokens, or destroys tokens, you know, like burns them or slashes them or collects them as fees or something like that, you have to handle that imbalance. And so there's this type, um, and it's, it's changed a little bit recently, but there's the positive imbalance for when you created the uh, tokens and there's negative imbalance. And so then you can handle those imbalances by like, you know, doing something with the tokens. And in the simplest case, that just means like updating your total issuance. But, you know, in this case that we're looking at now, it might mean giving it to the treasury or splitting it between the block producer and the treasury or something like that. How are we actually splitting those? Um, oh, yeah. Bet yeah, right. Between the 80% goes to the treasury and one per or 20% goes to the whoever created the block. So it implements this trait. Um, wow, where's the name of the trait? I have to find the thing that matches with that left angle bracket. Oh, here. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. So it implements this trait on unbalanced for split two ways. Okay, that makes sense. And let's just look at the code. So, okay, so here's where we actually implement this trait on unbalanced for this weird type split two ways. And okay, yeah, and it's just like I said, it's one of these traits that only has a single function. So like, you know, in some sense, we wanted to just pass in, right, uh, where were we? Uh, oh, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, so right here, when we were doing this like pallet transaction payment, what we really wanted to do was just pass in a function here, right? But like I, you know, like I described, you can't pass in a constant, you can't pass in a function, you can't pass in a struct. It always has to be a type. And so we pass in a type where the type implements a trait and has exactly one method. And so like, finally, here's the business logic that we were looking for, this on non-zero imbalance. So it says like, hmm, let's see. We create total, which is a U32. And then, oh yeah, okay. So it's, it's generic in these uh, types like part one and target one, part two and target two. So you can see where we did those um, over here. Oh crap, where did it go? Uh, part one is this four thing and, and target one is treasury. Part two is, um, you know, one and target two is author. And then uh, let's see, so we say let amount one is going to be the amount that came in as a parameter. Um, and then we multiply it by, oh yeah, part one dot value dot into over total dot into. Okay, yeah, so like, you know, a lot of this dot peak and dot saturating mall is like safety stuff and type checker stuff. But basically we're taking the amount, multiplying it by part one and dividing by the, the total part. So this is going to be like multiply it by four divided by five. That's how we get 80%. Um, then, okay, once we've done that, we, we split this imbalance that we got, this imbalance item that makes us deal with these imbalances. We split it into two separate imbalances, you know, in one and in two. And then finally, we take these places that it's going, target one, that was the treasury, and we, you know, we give it its imbalance. Okay, cool. So if we didn't want to do this fancy, like deal with fees by splitting it two ways thing, if we were just like, uh, oh, sorry. If we were just going to say like, all of this goes to the treasury, boom, <laughs> pass that entire imbalance to the treasury and it, it can deal with it. But because we wanted to do it in a little bit more complex way, uh, then we, we made that instance of the split two ways struct. And then, you know, you can imagine, like, I doubt that this is already coded, but you could imagine maybe we wanted to split three ways. We could just code another, another type similar like that. I'm just curious if, oh yeah, that's the only one that's in there. So, 
Yeah, nice. Joshy, when I did the UTXO workshop, um, one of the things that I saw, but it was kind of implemented for me, so it, I don't really understand it, but it was there. Um, yeah. They talk about distributing leftover fees at the end of the block and using uh, something called a hook in Substrate to do that. Um, and so I'll, in the chat, um, after I finish up, I'll, um, I'll post a link to the relevant section in the UTXO blog post. Oh, sure. Um, do you, I mean, I would actually be fine. Like, so we pretty much covered the stuff that I felt like we had to cover. If you want to, we can just look at that right now. Where can I find that code? Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me just find the, the blog post. I uh, was here on the UTXO workshop on the substrate developers hub, and then it links to this uh, blog post. And so I was just kind of looking around in the blog post. Um, for the relevant section. And I think this is what I was looking for, this block rewards part. And um, you can see it's kind of talking about what we're talking about here, distributing leftovers. And so this spend leftovers function was implemented in the runtime. Um, and then I'm trying to remember. Yeah, so then there's this, this is the handler that gets called on block finalization. Um, so I think, you know, this is kind of, again, I don't really understand this. I just saw it, but this wasn't part of the workshop. It was just something that was implemented in the, the template code. Um, so just when we were talking about this, it kind of recalled this subject. So I wanted to point it out yeah. to people. Yeah, I, so I can explain some of it. I don't know about all of it, but we could just kind of go down the rabbit hole and see how far we get. So this on sure. finalize function, there's two functions that you can put in your palette. So like we can see that's inside Deca module. So there's on initialize and there's on finalize. And yeah, and obviously you can put as many dispatchable calls in there as you want, but those two are special functions. And basically with on initialize and on finalize, they run at the very beginning of every block and at the very end of every block respectively. So no initialization to do here, but this on finalize one, there is something to do. And it looks like it says handler called by the system on block. Oh yeah, right. That's just, that's the part I already explained. So what are they doing in there? They come up with a list of authorities and um, Oh, that's okay. So that's just going to be whoever created the blocks. They're getting that from like, there used to be this palette called consensus palette that you can see they're using there and that, that got refactored. Yeah. And that was one of the things that was kind of a pain in the butt for me to figure out how to re-implement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So here, let me just, um, so other people have easy access to this. Uh, let me just like share. Already. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yep. Oh, not, okay, to, cool. no, not to that blog though. Yeah, go ahead and send, or I can send that one, I guess. Or. Okay, cool. Um, I actually could, I mean, I, I'd like to kind of pull the group for some help on the, the little challenge that you proposed to me earlier this morning, um, if we have some time for that. Yeah, yeah, tell, tell us the context. Sure, um, so Josh and I were chatting a uh, couple hours ago, I guess, um, and some of you may have seen that I've been doing some work with the EVM palette and looking at, you know, uh, creating and interacting with smart contracts and everything. And so um, one of the things that I was trying to do was uh, create and interact with an ERC-20 contract. So um, I can, I, I'd like to kind of show you guys what's happening and maybe you can help me figure out why it's not working the way that I'd like it to. Um, so just to kind of back up, what I have running locally is, um, it's this project here, which is kind of a little template project that I'm working off of. Um, and let me put this, in the chat for y'all. Okay, so this is how you kind of like can get up and running to, to where I am. Um, and so now I have my, um, 
my chain with the EVM palette. And so I've, I've got some stuff set up. So like I did the Genesis block configuration. So Alice has some, some currency or whatever. Um, and you can deploy contracts using EVM bytecode. And so I'm working on making that a little bit easier, but right now it's fairly straightforward to get EVM bytecode using existing tools like um, the Remix Solidity Web IDE. So this is a really straightforward ERC-20 contract. Joshi, what I did is I just uh, took the Open Zeppelin implementation and then just stripped out all the imports and stuff. And I think it basically made the contract small enough that it was willing to give me the bytecode. Joshi and I were having some problems getting the bytecode for this um, earlier. Um, so wait, 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 wait what I can... I have a question. So like what, what we did earlier yeah. was pasted this code in here and then in some other files pasted like dependencies, like safe map was one of them. And I kind of forget what the other ones were and clicked compile and it acted like it worked. It like didn't give an error, but then when you click copy the byte code, it like just wouldn't copy anything. But you're saying like, it seems like that was just a limitation because it, it was too many bytes or something like that. Exactly. Because I think, you know, with solidity, I think, you know, more or less under the hood when you're doing imports, it's like inlining all that code. And so the more stuff that you import, it's just like, you know, increasing the size of your payload. Mm -hmm. um, and so by stripping all of that out, I dramatically decrease the size of the payloads, but it's, you know, very, very unsafe. So this is now uh, vulnerable to overflows and underflows. And there was all sorts of special checking they did for the message dot sender that's not happening now. So, you know, this certainly isn't a uh, secure ERC 20 implementation, but it is a fun one. Um, so uh, yeah. So uh, I, I basically long story long, uh, I got a example of an ERC 20 contract that remix wants to give me the byte code for. So let's go ahead and, and copy that byte code. You can see now it copies it to the clipboard. Um, and just I'll uh, come in here and we'll just copy that to the clipboard. And if you're familiar with like Soul C or whatever, or Truffle or even, this probably looks familiar to you. But basically what I'm interested in is this object thing here. This is the byte code that I want. Um, and so just to make this easier to read, I'll just copy this and uh, get rid of everything else. We want to, you know, let let everyone know that it's hex, so we'll preface it with a zero X. So now this is the byte code of our ERC-20 contract. Uh, so just copy that. And so now is, I can go. I have a question. I have a question for you. So that, yeah. like, that long hex number, that is basically like executable solidity, or not even solidity, like executable EVM code, I guess. That's like a program yep. that the EVM can run. Okay, so this yep. is like in some ways analogous to whenever we generate a chain spec and we see that really long blob that says code, that's like our, our WASM runtime code. That's like kind of how this is. Yeah. Probably, yeah. I'm, I'm, I know even, believe it or not, I know less about WASM than I do about Rust. If you, I didn't know that was possible. Um, but that, that sounds about right. Um, okay. So now what we can do is we can go to the extrinsic app and uh, go to the EVM module, and we're going to create this contract. So init is going to be the bytecode. Uh, value would be if we wanted to seed it with some ether, uh, which we don't. It's not necessary here. Uh, these are just dummy values. Uh, this is, again, this is all kind of like Ethereum stuff, so I'm not going to talk too much about this. I'm assuming you kind of know what it is. So I'm just going to set the gas limit to the maximum value and the gas price to what I would imagine is the minimum value. I haven't played around with this too much. Um, so now I can submit this transaction. Where did you, where did you get that, map, that gas limit? That's just like the biggest integer that will fit in some U8 or something? Or you, no, more than that, like U2. U32. Okay, yeah, yeah. U32. So I just got it from the rough stocks. Okay, oh yeah, okay, cool. Um, so you're actually like making, you're deploying a contract using uh, this EVM palette, right? This is just like deploying a contract to Ethereum? Okay. Yep, yep. And, and if you follow along with the, that, I don't, this isn't working, so we're going to have to figure out what's going on right now. Um, if you follow along with that template project that, that I linked, um, we 
successfully interact with a contract. What I may be able to show you is unsuccessfully interacting with a contract, but let's see why this isn't working. Is there any is there any chance that it just takes a long time to because it's such a like oh no okay it shouldn't I, I it didn't before it may now if my computer is upset I, my computer is actually not super uh, fancy these days um, but let's let's just try one more time and see what happens just to make sure that every test of the code with EVM is real EVM let's say this shuffle. I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Uh, yes, have you tested the contract already? So basically that code on the real AVM, let's say on some kind of Ethereum testnet or developer network? Oh, that's a, that's a good point. Like, Gleb, you're saying, do we even know that this code works at all? Like, oh, yes, yeah. you... that's usually the first question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it, it's basically, it's open Zeppelin code. So it's kind of one of those things where like, I assume it works, you know, um, but I now I, I haven't been able to get it to work. So maybe I'm missing something. I was kind of like, it could be that my contract doesn't work, but I don't think so. I mean, we can take a little bit of a closer look. It, it's again, pretty straightforward. I removed um, all the imports. So that meant that I had to define these events myself because these had been defined in the, the ERC-20 interface. And then I created this constructor. And yeah, I did do something stupid here. Um, I shouldn't have set the total supply, uh, but I don't think that would have made a difference. So the way that I'm reading this is when this gets constructed, we mint 100 tokens to whoever created it. So that should be Alice. Um, but but let's let's just try to at least get this to to deploy right now. Let's see if we can get that far. Okay, so that time it worked. And so yeah, now good. what we need to do. What, what did, you, did you, yeah, I've got a question. Did you do anything different this time from when we tried before? Or, oh, okay, just mm -hmm. took another try. It's probably just my computer being weird. Like I can hear my computer right now, like groaning and struggling. So I, it's probably my environment. Um, so uh, as you've probably noticed, I'm still kind of figuring out exactly what this means, um, but you don't get a response back from an extrinsic. So um, I created this contract, but it's like, okay, great. Uh, where does this contract live now? What's the address? And so the good news is, is that contract addresses are deterministic in the EVM. And the way that you determine them is by taking a combination of the account nonce that created the contract and then the account address. And so because we just created the contract, the, the nonce has already been updated. So we're going to need to do a little uh, math here, uh, but I'm going to assume that everyone will be able to handle that. So we, we created the contract with Alice. So this is Alice's um, EVM account address. So we're gonna we're gonna go and we're gonna see what Alice's nonce is. So Alice's nonce is seven. So that means when she created the contract, her nonce was six, and we know what her uh, uh, address is. Um, and so now I have this utility here that's going to allow me to get the. Um, the address for this contract. And you can see it's, it's really super simple. Uh, I just provide the nonce, which I think I said was six, right? Um, and then Alice's account, and then I can run this and I'm, you know, I'm going to make a UI or something that makes all this easier, but just for now, this is the way it's happening. Um, <clears throat> okay. So now this should be our contract address and let, let's see if that, uh, works. And so if we put this here and we look at this, because now a contract is an account. So if we look at this account, it may not look super exciting to you, but the reason that I know that it worked now is because the nonce is one. It's already been incremented. So let's look at some garbage address. Let's just, you know, do that. Um, and so here the nonce is zero. So even though we don't have an, a, ba a balance, we can tell that this is like an active account. Because it has um, it has that um, that nonce. Okay, yeah. so, so now then, like, based like, on the so like when you deployed that contract, you chose to give it zero value. 
it, presumably if you had given it some ETH or, you know, well, I guess we're calling it ETH in there, it would show that value that the contract held that value as well, right? Yeah, yep. cool. And I haven't tried that yet. I would like to try that. Uh, but I really want to see if people can help me figure out what's going wrong. Um, uh, and, and we're really super close. So cool. Joshi okay. and I, Joshi, do you mind sharing this um, link in the yeah. chat? Because we were looking at this for, um, so one thing, again, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with Ethereum smart contract development, but like nothing is actually private on Ethereum. Like it's private from other smart contracts, but anyone can dig into the, the raw storage and like uh, get out the results that they want. So if I'm looking at this code, and again, don't take my word for it, there could be something wrong here. When we created this function, we should have minted a hundred tokens to Alice. So let's go take a look at the mint function because I, I need more eyes on this, but I think that we're okay. So one thing that you'll notice is like I said, I did make a mistake. I, I shouldn't have set total supply before calling this. Um, so there's gonna be some weird imbalance there, uh, but I don't think it's gonna mess anything up. Um, so we, you know, we, we increment total supply by the amount that we're minting, then we increase the amount of the account that we're minting to by the amount that we're minting, and then we emit an event. So seems pretty straightforward to me that when this contract was constructed, there should be, um, now if we go back up here and look, in this balances mapping, when we look for Alice's address, we should see a balance of 100 there. And so if you want to find um, the storage slot, um, you're supposed to be able to find it by concatenating the key. Oh, I think I just realized what I did wrong. So I was concatenating slot then key. It's key then slot. So I want to see if I can get this to work. Um, so I'm just going to make this a little different here. Uh, so Dan, can I ask a question just to make sure I know like what our yes. is here? So like you, you deployed this contract and then in order to kind of like bring it full circle and say like, you know, it seems like it worked, but in order to say like, look, that worked, it did what we thought, what we'd really like to do is be able to say like, okay, you know, Alice's balance in this ERC20 token that we deployed is blank. But unlike if this were a palette where you can just click on chain state and, you know, like easily see her balance, we have to do a little bit of, you know, like math and hashing and whatever else just to like actually read, figure out where in storage this thing goes and then read it out of storage. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So I have another question for you. So, yeah. So when you're doing, so you're reading, you're on chain state, you're reading account storages, right? And it takes H160 and H256. So that H256, that's like the slot thing that you just calculated from that diagram in the article. What is the H160? What is What goes there? The address of the account whose storage we want to query. So like the contract address in this case? Okay, yeah. so that so I, I had this question when you sent me that article too. So I was wondering like, okay, I think I get it, especially some of those earlier parts of the, the article were seemed really straightforward. Like, you know, if you just have in storage a bunch of, you know, I don't know, like fixed with integers or something, they just go one after the other. But what I wondered then was like, well, you know, if I have six contracts deployed and they all have that same storage, like are they gonna overwrite each other? But now it sounds like, every contract has its own whole storage space that is its own. Yes, yes. Okay. And that, that goes back to the sandboxing that the EVM provides and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, I mean, there's all kinds of trouble you can get yourself into with EVM storage, and people who want to learn more about that should complete the Ethernaut, uh, which is provided by Open Zeppelin and really digs into some of the trouble that you can get into there. Um, but so what, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to calculate 
the correct storage slot, as Josh was saying. And if you go through the the vanilla template that, that I linked uh, at first, we, we do kind of dig into these storage slots, but it's much, much more straightforward because it's just a UINT value in the, in the zeroth storage slot. But here I'm trying to index into this array. And so it's supposed to be this, um, yeah, you're supposed to hash the, the slot. No, see, it was right before. This is one of those things where, you know, you compute a value and then you hash it and then you concatenate and then you hash again and then you have to like pray and do a rain dance and. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what I'm, what I need to do is figure out for this tutorial, how to get the slot for, it's the map in storage slot zero and then the the element with the key that is Alice's address. So that's the problem that I'm going to be hacking on for the rest of the day. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's cool. I, I mean, so like to bring this back to the tokens, the idea was we saw the balances palette, we saw the assets palette, we saw the generic asset palette. We saw like really briefly, we didn't dive in too much, the UTXO palette, which is like a Bitcoin style way to do a, a currency. And then we talked about how to do it as a smart contract, either with EVM like you're doing here or with WASM contracts. And so you deployed an ERC-20 contract and the like last missing piece is just being able to read Alice's balance out of that contract. Cool. That's what I'm thinking, trying to figure that all out, but we're getting close, I think. Yeah, totally. I can't believe it too. This is not one of those cases where I hit you up, you know, like a week ago and said, hey, would you like to present this on seminars? It was literally like a few hours ago. So I'm impressed how much progress you did make. Um, and, you know, obviously this is true for Dan and for anybody else on the call. If you figure this out or even if you don't, but you make progress or something like this kind of stuff is always welcome on seminar. So whoever has something to show or, you know, progress to show, um, definitely just contact me and we can get it in there. So, yeah, and you can make my Friday a lot better if you figure this out for me. So I really appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's end here for, for this week. Thanks everybody for coming and for your, your questions and for following along and I'll look forward to seeing everybody next week. Thank you, thanks Josh. Everyone. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks, See you yeah. next time.